Hi, good evening, uh, and thank you for all uh, being here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see people at the museum uh, and, and on the evening on a weekday. But uh, just a quick uh, few words about what we're doing here, what we're up to, and, and what we hope to achieve. So um, a little over about a year ago, we, we were talking about what show can we create that engages with not just the typical idea of modern contemporary art that, that we collect, that, that the museum's uh, collection agenda is, and how do we do something that's a little different from uh, just the everyday exhibition that one tries to curate. So, um, at that point of time, we were also looking at a slightly deeper history, which, which you will kind of partially see <coughs> illustrated here. And, and, and we got quite deep into researching what this was. Um, and then we subsequently acquired a series of pieces um, that are very similar to this. And this is what one uh, calls the Bombay School Pottery, right? or, or Terry Ware, or <coughs> Wonderland Pottery. And it was fascinating for us that there was this huge culture of ceramic, of pottery in the 1850s, which started with the Great Exhibition uh, in, in England. And then uh, there were a series of uh, teachers at JJ School who were promoting and manufacturing ceramic for an entirely export-oriented market in the West. And, and we started researching the history, and then of course we found out that the BDL has a huge repository of this. And then we went to uh, Albert Hall Museum in Jaipur, and, and you start to see that there's this large legacy of Indian ceramics. So we said, okay, there's something here, and we need to explore this. And, and when we started doing that, is when we started talking to uh, the curators of this exhibition, Annapurna and Sindhu, and we said, you know, how do we explore the idea of uh, ceramics? And, and then that's when she said, you know, there's uh, ceramics in India post-1940. We're aware of it in bits and pieces. We're aware of, you know, what is happening in various uh, studio potters. And so I said, okay, let's look at this. And, and that's where this whole initiative started. And um, as time went along, uh, of course, we were made aware that there is the uh, big triennale happening at JKK next year. And of course, Mark is putting out this whole publication. So it was interesting that you know it was this point in time that everybody in this country started talking about ceramics. So um, we were quite enthusiastic about it, and we set up this show. And um, I'm, you know, so Mutable uh, came about, and it was a review of works from 1947. And just a small highlight. I'm sure most of you would have uh, seen the works or heard about the works, but for us, it was interesting because. Uh, this entire exhibition you see here has been borrowed. It's a very big part of what we do. We like to collaborate with other collections and collectors. We don't necessarily like to only showcase what we have. So it was quite interesting. Uh, a lot of the stuff, it looks, I mean, it's out here on display and it looks nice and it looks easy, but uh, there are certain uh, works of ceramic, I believe, are very rare, very unique, uh, very, I mean, they are uh, national treasures to this country. And, and particularly cases where NID has lent us, I think it's the first time they've ever lent uh, anything outside of NID, and, and we were lucky to uh, get these pieces here to be displayed. Uh, and there are many such wonderful uh, pieces like that. But the idea that there has been one review, right, and it's, it's a, we've created this dialogue, we've started people thinking about ceramics as not just something that is decorative, but also more serious in terms of everything it brings into our art and culture scene, right? It's, it's uh, the influences are as large as any other art form uh, that you hear of or, or, or see every day. So um, with that, um, I'm sure you guys can walk around the exhibition later again. And um, yes, I'd like Rashmi to introduce everybody. Thank you. Um, I, as, as she said, I live in New Mexico, but I was at Ray Maker's um, studio. I was, a, I was an apprentice at Ray Maker's in early 90s, and many of us on this committee met around that time, and we've all, you know, worked in our own direction since then. But about a year ago, maybe two years ago, Anjani, told me that she and Beneath had been discussing, she Beneath and maybe Madhuri as well, had been discussing the idea of starting a clay tree in LA. H having lived now in the US for almost 17 years, um, I've seen what what a big role these clay triennales play in, I mean, not necessarily a triennale, but 
these events play in raising the idea of what artists working primarily in the clay medium can do. And um, you know, I very I still have this this. Uh, uh, question asked of me, or this assumption made when I say I work with clay is that I make functional work, which is not to say that I don't enjoy making functional work, I do, but I work as a sculptor. So the idea that clay can be a very strong sculptural medium is beginning to come of age, and we really wanted to uh, create an event that would be repeated, that would uh, take forward this idea of clay as a cutting edge medium, and something that you can work with. So, um, thinking that this was the first clay triennale, we chose the name Breaking Ground, the, um, and I'll just go through a little bit of what we were planning to do. There are, um, after having worked on it for about a year, we have 45 artists, including international artists, some international artists who are going to be presenting their own work at, at the event. We have more than eight speakers. This, this text is a little bit, might change a little bit, but anyway, several indoor and outdoor spaces and many collaborations. We were very lucky to be able to uh, partner with the Jawahar Kala Kendra in Jaipur, and it's going to start on the 31st of August next year. Um, what's interesting about this particular event is that it's an artist-driven in initiative. So. As artists, we really felt strongly that we needed this platform. And there are six of us, all our faces there. Vineet Kakkar, Anjani Khanna, myself, Neha Kutchakar. <coughs> Did I say that right? <laughs> <laughs> Marvi and Rea who can't be here today. And th these, these uh, images are taken from our, the brochure that we made, so there's a lot of extra information. I'm not going to make you read all of it, but we've all got very varied experience and have been working together trying to set this up for a while. The vision is that what we're trying to do is to showcase and, nourish, and nourish the growing diversity of ceramic art and expression in India and bring the best practices in international ceramic art to India and also expose international ceramic artists to what we can do here. A few years ago there was a very good, um, a very large scale uh, residency that 17 of us went on to China and one of the artists who set it up, other writer, he's part of our, our group of listening, said that the idea is that we only make elephants in India. So it was, it's, it's nice to be able to go further than that. The objective is to encourage the, and, 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 and so we set out an open call, asked, asking people to send in proposals and the main one, the primary criteria that we gave was that they should try to stretch beyond what they would normally have done, try to experiment, go in directions that they may not have gone. And so there is a certain amount of experimentation going on with this, and you know, we hope that it will all work out better. We'd like to encourage a wider discourse on clay and clay art, and to engage with the public as well. So Jawahar Kala Kendra as a venue works very well in that sense because it's, it is a public venue and people come there for many kinds of events and so we're hoping that we can create an excitement about this. Um, the other partner we have is the Akshara Foundation for the Arts and um, uh, together with them we're going to try to work with an outreach program with students as well. Jawahar Kala Kendra is, a, is, is itself, the architecture of it was by Charles Korea and um, it, it provides a fantastic stage for really making art that stretches your imagination. So we really enjoyed visiting it this year. We have an exhibitions coordinator, a much, much put upon exhibitions coordinator who basically has to do everything because we are just unable to manage, organize it ourselves. And Kanika is an extremely experienced person working, has been working in this field for a long time, and we're very fortunate to have her. She isn't here today, but we're lucky to have her. And we have an amazing advisory committee. And Mr. Peter Nagy, who's sitting here today in the audience, and we really rely on him for information and how to go about doing this professionally and you know to bring the best out. 
Pooja Sood is the director of the Jawahar Kala Kendra, and she has been a rock in, in being able to get this up. As you can imagine, it's the first time event in India. There isn't much, um, much knowledge or support. So we are going, trying to create this knowledge. You know, and um, Pooja herself is really interested in the ceramic arts. And you know, her support has been invaluable. And we're very lucky, again, I repeat, to have Jawahar Kala Kendra. Our teacher, Ray Maker, is part of this. And um, man, you know, many of us met <laughs> working at Ray's place and learning our craft over there. And um, so he works at an enormous scale. Many of you probably know his work. And um, he's a third main advisor. Um, since we're talking about Ray, I just, we, I just got a letter that Ray was uh, Ray and Deborah both had been um, chosen, um, had been were nominated and were awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award in the United States for their contribution to the to the art and craft of clay. There will be several components to the to the Triennale. We'll have exhibitions, of course. Some of them will be performance related. The first image here is of an Israeli artist Esther Beck, and it's a film that she has where she's actually working with the clay. We'll have a symposium, where, and we are announcing today that we're putting out a call for symposium papers to sing, and that's going to be put onto our website today itself. Um, then there's uh, there'll be workshops, you know, and in the end, the thing, the the triennale, what's unique about this one compared to the others that I've been to is that it it's not for like a three day, four day, or one week period. It stretches all the way from the 31st of August when we open right into the end of October, and November 18th. And so it's almost three months, and so it gives us a lot of um, uh, many avenues to having workshops and creating a sustaining a sustained interest in what's going on. And we're also toying with the idea of working with an editathon and trying to create more knowledge on, through Wikipedia about ceramics in India. The, there's some, some, we're trying to talk about what the impact of having an event like this could be in India. It's, it, you know, there's an educational aspect to it and there's patronage and discourse. And the importance of the Triennale is that you know having a recurring event allows you to be, to develop a, a language and a and an, you know relationship with the arts and the people in the arts. We all you know we would like to encourage it to become more than just about the clay arts because we feel we belong to the art family just as much as the arts belong to us. So we hope through this Triennale that we can begin to expand those boundaries as well. This is a complete list of the of the forty artists we chose, um, and we had we had more than eighty entries, and ultimately brought it down to the more hundred and three a hundred and three entries. Yeah, and through a long process of initial um, sort of an initial categorization, then we went through several layers of working together, and then we decided on this after the jury process. We have um, our friends and supporters, Kanchan Dalal, who has a gallery, had a gallery in Ahmedabad. Sangeeta Jindal is, has, is uh, supporting us with, with uh, <coughs> money, and we're trying really hard to raise money. So if you all can know about this, please help us. Dr. Rathi Jaffer, from, uh, who's in charge of the Korea Center in, in um, Chennai is helping us with bringing a really amazing Korean artist who to come and work at the thing. Ambika Beri is supply, you know, is providing her place for residencies, and um, Bina Sarkar is going to help us with uh, with communication and the catalog, and uh, we're hoping to produce a really beautiful catalog of people's work and how they're going through this process. And Sangeeta Sinkatiya Radha is the Moraka Foundation of Arts is also supporting us. And we feel very fortunate to have all of these people. This is just the language of the open call. We'll be sending it out today. And I'd like to announce that we are, start, we, we are sending out an open call for papers today as well. Thank you. Um, um, 
walked into the ceramic studio of Bharat Bhavan and was given a lump of clay and wasn't really told anything. And um, so I was with clay for, for two hours and I realized that uh, that was happening for the first time to me. Uh, I lost this a sense of time and space where I was. I completely was, you know, almost absorbed into clay. And this was something which had never ever happened to me. And so uh, I, I suddenly realized, I, I heard um, someone calling me and say, so are you in conversation with clay? Did it strike? And uh, yeah. So that was the day when I um, really, um, really got talking to ceramic and this was a, a, a we spoke to each other and yet uh, without kind of speaking and I realized that I really belonged uh, there, you know. And uh, before that I was a science student so this was, uh, um, you know, I had no previous uh, inkling of, you know, anything feeling like that. Um, but then um, the next part of the story is like a bit more like this. This first love at first sight wasn't as uh, easy to continue because uh, I, I initially trained as a potter and uh, uh, though I, it was, it was, um, how should I put it? Like the first thing was that uh, I realized that uh, this um, equilibrium between, uh, between the, between utility and aesthetic was something which 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 was uh, I was find, finding it uh, really hard to handle. Um, I I I slowly I I do very little of utility things now, but I really still love things which can be used in everyday life, can be held, and you know can you can hold them in your hand and you can look at it at different angles, different places, in different light, and it's a very different feeling. Uh, it's a, it's a, it gives you a kind of warmth which, which only a clay object probably uh, can give. But uh, like architecture, um, I think with pottery also the issue is that you know it's, if it is, if, if it is something where you have to, um, which can, which has to be used and which, uh, where, a space which is to be lived. Um, then, uh, then the balance is very precarious. I mean, how? So that was uh, the initial struggle. Uh, as uh, I was constantly making things which were to be used, and yet um, uh, um, every time I made something, I decided no, this has to be, you know, more balanced. Nothing of, uh, but uh, but this struggle went on for a while. And then the other uh, uh, very serious difficulty I had was that for a very long time I somehow um, uh, was not really coming to terms with my forms. I, I was, when I was doing my pottery forms and also my sculptural works, somehow, um, uh, uh, how should I say, I was not quite owning them. You see, I, I mean, I was making them, and yet all the time I felt uh, uh, I wasn't really. I don't know. I was apologetic about it, and I was not giving it the kind of uh, space, uh, any work of any work of art or whatever you are doing. You know, it uh, it it requires a. a kind of warmth, a kind of love, a kind of togetherness for it to speak to you and to for you to speak to that. But um, so it went on for a long while and I felt that my forms were not, to, you know, um, uh, they don't have the character probably which I was looking for. And um, so, uh, but interestingly, one of my friends in one of my exhibitions, all the time I was working and I was exhibiting, and then one of the one of my friends at, uh, at my exhibition said, but your forms are, are like you. 
and why would they be, uh, you know, they, since you are unsure, they probably would be unsure since, uh, you know, and um, that uh, simple sentence was quite a, you know, revelation to me. And I, I for the first time, I really started uh, spending time with my work. I mean, spending time in the sense that I really uh, uh, gave it more space and more care and more love. And um, I mean, I, 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 for the first time, I understood that um, my for my forms to uh, carry along, uh, you know, they need they need more space and they don't need they need more time because. You know, I was not letting them be, and uh, so this is the probably the first series where I uh, kind of uh, uh, came out of it. This series was called uh, Shadows, and uh, as you would see in most of my works, uh, uh, for me, the form probably is. is very important and um, the, the concept or the theme um, uh, mostly you know reveals itself in the process most of the time I mean I when I say uh, when I call this these shadows um, I think somewhere in the middle of it I realized I was working uh, on this idea of shadows which was very close to me from my childhood I and mean, then um, this, this horizontal component of anything vertical. And, uh, and later, uh, uh, I work in Bharat, uh, I used to work in Bharat Bhavan Bhopal studio, and uh, <laughs> later now I work from my own studio. But then later, while uh, when I had finished this series, actually working on the series, I realized that it also had to do with my connection with Bharat Bhavan and the, you know, the, the domes of Bharat Bhavan's architecture probably, but this is all what I uh, realized later. So that, um, uh, that is how mostly things uh, uh, happen. Uh, I mean, I, I feel that uh, when one is working on a series and one when spends when one spends more time with it, I mean there are moments, uh, there are images which are like really compressed probably, and they suddenly um, start expanding. And uh, uh, that's the interesting uh, part for me because suddenly. It's it reveals so many narratives which were probably, you know, somewhere folded uh, within you. And the unfold the series was called Mirrors. And um, so I, after that, I, as I told you, I started working in series and um, uh, so that, um, and it's more of the subconscious which then surfaces uh, Slowly, uh, this uh, uh, this was a series. Uh, um, uh, these like these are not really utility. But as I told you, I was initially um, trained as a potter, and for a very long time, I continued with things which 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 forms which were either from pottery or um, uh, you know they were at least hollow and they could contain and uh, not uh, this series also. Um, I Once upon a time I used to be a, a student of uh, forest ecology and I was also very, very passionate about, uh, I'm, I'm still very passionate about uh, uh, tree life in general. So um, I did a long series, this series was called Reflections. And um, and uh, as you can see, I mean, still the idea of the pot continues, um, though it has uh, done, sometimes it has become a kind of pedestal, the pot actually. But but uh, 
but actually I was toying with the idea of reflection of uh, things and in it, where it, and, um, and as I was saying, um, my, um, you know, in my forms, um, in sculpture especially, I, I like this idea of juxtaposition of, uh, you know, weightlessness and weight, where um, I, I like it when, uh, when the center of gravity is a uh, bit uh, difficult to locate. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, that was the thing which was um, initially which, um, which, uh, which, which was very difficult for me because I, I, I used to think that my things are, I don't know, they, are, they don't lose uh, strength and they are rather fragile and all that. But then I later realized that, yeah, well, that's the nature of my things and I, I have to come to terms with it. And, uh, and it's also interesting that uh, um, how, how certain forms and things um, though you are working on different forms in different stages of life, but strangely, when you see your work um, at a glance, you realize how you know certain images have been recurring right from the beginning, and um, uh, uh, for as Rashmi was telling you, I, for, for 21 years I was working with a museum of anthropology which is called Museum of Mankind. It is in Bhopal. It, uh, it's a huge museum which is spread over 250 acres and I worked uh, there and I had, the, uh, I had this amazing opportunity of uh, working with traditional potters and visiting their places across India. Uh, and uh, somewhere, um, I, I, I realized, you know, in, in rural India, the idea is that the entire geography is considered sacred. And uh, so you don't have shrines, you don't have images of deities most often, but, but the, the, the mountain or the tree itself is the deity, uh, is the residence at least of deity, of the deity. And then you have some figurines which are uh, offered there as water terracotta. But here I suddenly, uh, when, when I was working on the series, I realized there was it, uh, the, the animal forms and the tree forms kind of um, you know, transformed and gelled into each other and, uh, mm, and uh, something of this kind um, appeared. Um, and I was wondering, I mean, for me, it was a, Eureka moment when I came up with this form of plant animal together. But people who saw my works from outside said, oh, but you have been surrounded with these terracotta images for so long, so it has obviously come from there. But I mean, strangely, for me, it came after a huge, long, long process. And uh, I, I don't know, I mean, of course I was surrounded with them, but I kind of reached it um, through a very long route, actually. But that's the that's the process of, I guess, um, uh, uh, evolution, I believe. And that's the beauty of it uh, because it it's always strikes you with. Um, These are all high fired. Most of them are uh, high fired. Uh, uh, fired between 1240 to 1280 cm. All in. And how big are they? Uh, some of the pieces are like um, about two feet. Uh, most of them. This is a series I'm still working on. It was. So somehow the connection with botany and I have 
uh, as I was saying, uh, this idea of uh, the lightness of being and the grace of the, uh, of the, of the plants and uh, plants, the world in general and the animal forms is like something which intrigues me um, and attracts me to know. Um, this was um, again a series uh, which was called Platters and Spoons, and but it was hardly um, you know utility. It was again very I mean the forms were that of a platter, but um, the treatment. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing, as I was saying, um, in sculptures, what um, what really attracts me is uh, when uh, with this this idea when the when when a uh, sculpture unfolds like a narrative that when it when it kind of expands beyond, uh, you know, it's it's kind of more. Uh, it's not static, and when it um, kind of, um, you know, for me, these forms with the images are. I mean, for me, they are like compass narratives which are unfolding. As I was saying, uh, when I was working with this museum, I. I was um, uh, very, very keen on, uh, uh, I've been collecting uh, mythologies, creation my myths from, um, you know, tribal communities, and I'm really, really interested in um, stories and narratives, and, um, and um, so I see something of that maybe in it. So this was, of course, this entire series was developed around a, a concept and a theme of, uh, which was called Digging Time and was curated by Vineet. Uh, um, and so the digging in time for me turned out to be, a, you know, an exploration of a moment which, which then went on expanding and. Uh, And uh, as you can see, what I was saying about the center of gravity, you know, I, my forms mostly tend to touch less. <coughs> um, you know, I mean, it would, this is very precariously kind of balanced, and it would, it would tilt if you would. Um, myself again. I'm Savia and uh, I want to begin this, um, you know, practice as well of collecting different tools constantly. So I had this collection of um, hardware tools that I used to kind of, you know, hold or kind of keep with me in the studio and uh, my paintings um, over the time developed with this very distinct um, uh, decorative style you know, very uh, kind of gone, the aboriginal, very, it had a very indigenous kind of a, you know, rooting to it. And the subjects were, you know, based on uh, myth and uh, symbolism. And uh, yes, and you can see even, you know, like the impressions of pigment and uh, traces of print making as well, because I used all those hardware, um, you know, uh, tools to, you know, build my rich and you know whatever colorful backgrounds uh, so i i went about for 12 years i i enjoyed the process thoroughly and um, uh, after a point i uh, i reached this uh, stage in my studio practice where i started to feel a very strong disconnect with you know my 
uh, I wouldn't say with the form of painting, but just my method. Uh, so it was it was this kind of a divorced feeling, you know. I was I was I was getting when I used to you know enter my studio space. Uh, every method for me was kind of um, you know well planned and meticulous and known to me. And um, I felt in my mind that I think I reached a very dangerous kind of a dangerous and a very interesting space, you know, where um, uh, there was there was nothing of uh, curiosity or the unknown. And because I had trained and because it was all this learnt, um, you know, practice, I I felt the need to unlearn. And that's where you know the whole thing began of. One fine day, I said, "Okay, I think I have to renounce this, uh, you know, method that I'm working with." And uh, I began, you know, I mean, I began hunting. I began kind of looking at different things, looking at different materials. Uh, for me, um, uh, I think uh, the preoccupation in my in my personal life and my personal inquiry has been always about, uh, you know, life and death and um, this entire thing of you know the body and the material, you know the the temporariness of the material uh, that we exist in, you know there is this this constant questioning of um, ephemeral and eternal, and like uh, this whole thing of that we exist, we perish, and also there is something more beyond that, you know which we are everywhere. So these were the questions I have always been preoccupied with and I was not able to find that resonance in my work and maybe that's the reason the, you know, I mean, I moved away from the methodic, uh, you know, practice of my painting. Uh, so uh, it was a great uh, one, one and a half, two years where I just uh, began collecting. I just, uh, I just traveled, you know, the earlier picture was, um, I was in Bhoj. I went into, you know, like digging um, uh, ammonite fossils in Bhuj. I used to just collect things uh, uh, which shed naturally. I was collecting precious stones, bones, uh, seeds. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but, you know, just being kind of this instinctive, maybe like a collector or a hoarder, wanting to have my own, you know, cabinet of curiosity, I went on with it. And um, then along the way, I, you know, I mean, I found uh, clay to engage with. Uh, you know, before I, I started to even like look into this direction, um, I thought I'll enroll myself and, you know, maybe uh, do this jewelry uh, uh, making sculpture or this wax sculptural works. And I'd enroll myself in this, um, for this course. And they had said that you have to return after a month because you know that what you're asking for the course is not available so why don't you engage in some other material and then join back again so um, so meanwhile I mean like I mean we all know there are there is lack of community uh, you know places in Mumbai for working in clay and ceramic and also kilns so I, I said okay let me just uh, go to this uh, uh, space in uh, Goregaon, uh, which was owned by Sandeep Manchekar, and he's a potter, and you know he had this studio in um, in Goregaon, and um, so it, it was this the place was in complete shambles, you know, the, the space which he had, but it was active. Uh, I got exposed to you know kiln making, uh, you know different kinds of uh, clay making. He was like a supplier, he was a teacher, and for me it was like. You know, a, a great ground to kind of. Uh, I felt like okay, this could be an interesting material because it had these paradoxical qualities I was looking for of you know strength and fragility and you know this creation and destruction and you know like a everyday teacup and it resonated something like a relic. You know, I mean, so time also played an important role. So such a primordial material. So I, I engaged with it at a at his studio, I kind of went head on with it. I never went back to that course that I said, you know, the jewelry course, uh, which I was supposed to return back a month uh, later. I never went back for that course. And you know, here in you know Goregaon and uh, the studio space, I just 
went for uh, you know just and uh, Sandeep Manchekar as uh, you know a potter and as a teacher he understood the space I came from uh, this whole unlearning space so he let me just kind of experiment constantly with you know however I wish to and there were no questions asked I kind of um, it's quite notorious actually melted quite a lot of uh, you know metal and glass and somehow even found the found objects that I had you know collected over time found its way into my test pieces. Um, I also created very, uh, I would say these were all experimental works that I did, you know, coming from that, the background of painting, you can still see that, you know, the, the whole um, methodic function here as well with the sketch and the work. And uh, that's how I kept engaging with, uh, you know, the material, um, but still experimenting. Uh, seeds, uh, found ash, bones, uh, found glass. So I, I kind of incorporated all of this in, uh, you know, my works. <laughs> I just only understood uh, from, uh, you know, Sandeep and uh, the course or whatever. I just learned the basics of making a clay body. And uh, I was very sure what I didn't want. I didn't want to learn or engage in glazes because I was just wanting to you know, use found materials in, in my, you know, ceramic work. So these are the few examples of where I worked and, you know, different spaces, IIT, IID, uh, IDC, Raja Mohanty, you know, I would, you know, I mean, go to, you know, fire there, Devani Smith's Pottery Studio. And so these were the places I kind of just, you know, went for it. I went uh, straight forward into, you know, my experiments with clay. And um, this was a point where I started uh, also on the side, again, like I say, uh, uh, collecting is a subconscious practice. It's not something very consciously that I've been doing, but it, it happens. And I started to collect and acquire a lot of, um, a lot of books, all sizes and shapes, not necessarily like, you know, um, it was from some author or some limited edition. It was just the sizes and the shapes of the books that I kept collecting. I knew that at some point they would find their way into my work. I, I didn't know how and what, but they were there. You know, I was surrounded by them all the time. So I started to then four years ago, um, <clears throat> unbind the books, you know, like kind of, um, uh, you know, tear the pages, rebind them again. Uh, smear them with clay and uh, I started uh, very heavily again experimenting with uh, you know this process and um, uh, several several failed attempts and experiments I mean again I I knew there was something in there you know I was I, I knew that there was uh, it was interesting this whole uh, process engaging with this material for me it was unmaking of one object to make another object. So that somehow I, you know, it was just, I was hell-bent and stuck on that, uh, you know, action or that act. And uh, I still wasn't very successful for a while, you know, I mean, a lot of books and again, um, uh, you know, the failed ones also looked beautiful and they were fantastic, but I wasn't there yet, you know, I, I didn't really, even think of building a body of work, even at this point and junction. And um, here, this is an example of, um, you know, um, the skill firing that I did. So this image or this, you know, this time, moment in time, I would, I would say was like a key moment for me because um, uh, I built these books, you know, I smeared them, I layered them with, you know, clay for, uh, for a certain point in time, it existed in a certain material for me. And, uh, and then at a hundred degree temperature, the, the book, the paper book leaves the kiln. And it leaves its you know, fragile representation of its original self. So that for me was kind of uh, you know, that aligning moment, I would say, in my practice where this is exactly what I have been, you know, preoccupied with or my, you know, inquiry based, you know, um, uh, you know, thoughts that 
yes, the material does not leave. You know, it it it, it kind of transforms itself, and uh, the same questioning, you know, of of the body and what happens to it and how many lives, and um, you know, and also the earth and geology. So it's talking about this whole eternal and affirmal again. And that's how then I um, finally began a you know, serious body of work uh, uh, titled Lithified Lives. So for me, these works um, embodied all of that that you know, I was kind of really looking for and kind of finally it started to resonate uh, you know, with my practice. Uh, it spoke of everything, like the layers spoke of uh, it, for me, it's almost like an individual. The layers speak of, you know, um, as an individual, karmic time, or uh, you know, as as a land, it's talking about geological time. And uh, the covers of the books for me are skins, you know, sedimentary. Uh, again, the materials that I used were all the found objects over the time that I had collected. So, uh, found ash, um, you know, sand, laterite. So they were these these were skins for me, different you know different forms of skins and um, also this entire you know like compressing fossilization you know so again I'm talking about time here with these works. Uh, the series also has um, actual animal bone, ash, uh, rope. So after the book series, of course, um, you know, I continued to do, uh, I continued with the book series and I, I created about 30 books uh, in the body of work. After the book uh, began this entire quest for, you know, finding the whitest white to work with, you know, in paper and also in clay. And um, of course, you know, all the ceramists in the room will, you know, just uh, say that, you know, one has to stop at porcelain when you're looking at you know, the whitest white if you're looking for. And, uh, you know, that's how my, my next body of work and the series of work uh, just began where um, I started to work with porcelain. Uh, paper got integrated constantly after that. After the bookmaking process, paper was as important as the clay body or the, you know, the porcelain that I worked with. Um, I began building, uh, I began hand building um, this entire field of um, uh, uh, impermanence. So this, uh, this, um, these works I, you know, hand built over a period of eight months, uh, building a, building about eight thousand six hundred and about pieces, just handmade and hand rolled. And um, again, if you see them very closely, you know. Paper is uh, present right there, but in its absence again. You know, you can see the deckled, uh, you know, edges that paper has left behind. And this particular work um, was titled "Shape Shifting Field." Uh, it responds to the space wherever it's exhibited or shown. A field of impermanence, and also not really directing it straight out uh, to look like a field of bones. Initially, it was supposed to be, uh, you know, a charred landscape of ashes, but the choice and the, 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 and the use of porcelain as a material kind of shifted it visually. So that's how it kind of gave this entire uh, work, this, you know, overwhelming feel of impermanence. So here it's exhibited at um, uh, Tarka Gallery where um, uh, in August um, uh, I had my uh, first solo show in, in the, the medium. And uh, three years ago, the gallery director, Hina Kapadia, showed uh, you know, interest in my process. And uh, this work was showcased there. And it's responding to the site there. So um, I think I would, uh, this is, the last image I'm showcasing in, in the presentation, but um, I'd like to talk about this particular work. It's uh, this as well was part of the show, uh, titled "Liminal Entities." 
again the subject um, and the state that I'm talking here is uh, the liminal state itself is a state that's in between uh, life and death and death and rebirth so it's it's a trance like state and uh, it's a very transitional state so I created these frozen objects you know kind of not yet and not anymore you know where it's kind of again in the state of becoming uh, and uh, I would also like to pause at this, you know, this, this, this object that I've made and really go back to, you know, where I began with, you know, with color, with so much of decoration in my work, you know, breaking free of, you know, the, that facade that I felt about, you know, of decoration in my work, you know, distilling my work over time. And um, finally, I, you know, I'm making these objects, building these objects. Um, which have actually just uh, three elements. Paper, again, that's a ghost material. Uh, porcelain, which is known for its, uh, you know, pristine and smooth, uh, you know, character. And I push it against its grain, making it so kind of visceral and, you know, internal, kind of wounded. And uh, rust, um, I have used rust, uh, found rust from degenerating metallic objects and uh, I've come to you know making works like this so for me I feel clay has um, you know lent itself for um, my questions you know my personal inquiries of you know death dissolution and uh, uh, you know degeneration and my metaphysical questions further and it has lent itself uh, in a very very beautiful way for me Thank you. I just want to talk a little bit about, before I start, just these three words. Uh, I have the word sacred in my presentation. And uh, these three words, uh, religious and uh, spiritual and sacred, I think they mean different things to all of us. And I'd just like to share one way of looking at these uh, which is that, for me, uh, anything which is external, religion is something which is external, which is, there's a God out there, and there is us, and there's some engagement with that. Uh, spiritual is when that inverts itself, where you're no longer concerned with the external so much as uh, what's happening inside you. Anything that you engage with can be made sacred. So that's where sacred comes in, that relationship with the external world when you're in this space. And uh, that's really so I'll be talking about uh, how I engage with the uh, sources, uh, you know, uh, of uh, examples of sacred uh, expression all over the country and uh, my own take on that. And essentially my work is uh, just comes out of a personal engagement with Eastern spiritual thought and uh, travels in the Himalayan landscape. And uh, something about uh, the first time I went up there, uh, there's a particular altitude which a lot of us must have been to where things, the landscape suddenly opens up. And uh, for me, the first time I confronted that, it seemed to open up something inside as well. And uh, Suddenly there was like a spaciousness that you felt inside, uh, which at least I had not felt before. And uh, that's really what one engages with in the studio when one makes things. Working with clay, it's uh, the kind of material which is very tactile, very, very uh, easy to, anything you do, any engagement, it leaves a mark. And uh, this landscape also, it, it, it filters in uh, the way I use clay, a lot of uh, texture, a lot of embedding things into the skin of the clay. And these are the Chortons. And uh, I have a degree in architecture. So the first time I saw these structures, uh, something I, I was really excited about them. And to me, it seemed like they were a three-dimensional model of this painting by the Zen monk uh, Sengai. And uh, this he calls the model of uh, the universe according to him. And uh, for me, it like, talks about different layers of how we can look at this world and ourselves. So there's a square which is 
engaging with just the elements which build up this world. There's the triangle which uh, is essentially talking about the three uh, states that we live in, dreaming, waking and deep sleep. And then there is a circle which is the unborn or something which uh, is timeless or, or beyond these, these notions of the other two. So to me the Chorten seemed like uh, you know, just something which picked up on this painting and made it three dimensional. And as an architect I was really excited by the form. And I've been working with it ever since in about 20 years, 25 years of practice. So in the beginning when I started working on these Chorten forms, uh, you know, I, I had learned functional, how to make functional pots after architecture. And so the first Chorten still had that functionality about them. The tops were lids which opened up and there was an inner space that you could access. And uh, these were more recent ones which were made a few years ago in China. And uh, here there was engagement with the context of uh, where they were made. And uh, they, they were called Huan Sing, Huan Sing's Dream. And so Huan Sing uh, was this Chinese uh, scholar who came to India and took Buddhist texts from India to China. And uh, because he thought that the quality of Buddhist texts in China was not good enough and they were losing the spirit of these texts. And here I was in China, which had a, it didn't seem like it, it was it had any patience for that uh, that history of theirs. And so, in a sense, I was trying to do the opposite of what Huan Sing was doing, with putting some Buddhism back into China. And of course, there's there's uh, the the reference to the the Chinese, the red of the communist red and the sickle. And these were from another series which were called The Architecture of Dissolution. And uh, for me, uh, it's very interesting to look at how when you look at the West, in the Western paradigm, if you achieve a lot, they build you a statue, they put it in the middle of a park. And in this, you know, there exists uh, parallelly a culture where if you become nothing or if you give up any sense of personal identity, they value it enough to build you a sculpture. So it's like two completely different ways of looking at the world that we all engage with. Uh, when I'm traveling, it's always like uh, somehow you're looking at all these ancient sources of uh, inspiration, but you're also looking at them through this very city sort of mindset that you have. And so when I look at this, is, this is in uh, Nepal, the image on the left. And it's all these wires through which you're seeing the stupa, everything that's happening, you know, in, in our world is just getting wired in a sense. And uh, somewhere that comes in, in you know, you, you don't, you're not really conscious of that. But for me, it's uh, using tradition, but also in a, in a way that breaks from tradition that comes through in the way I work with uh, these very traditional forms, but taking liberties with both the form, the decoration. Going back to the landscape, and uh, at a certain point, I started including elements of the landscape into my work. So these were shortened landscapes where uh, a bit of the landscape came in on which the shortened form was sitting now. And uh, for me also these uh, were about time, where uh, rocks essentially as I look at them is just layering of time. So it's, it's a reference to finite time. And the Chorten was a symbol for something beyond this sort of just, uh, you know, something uh, which didn't subscribe to these, uh, think, these notions of finite time. So it's playing the time and the timeless against each other. As Savia mentioned, this is my preoccupation also with death, life, time, everything in our own ways. I think several of us think about all of this, some maybe more than others. And uh, this is white, so for me winter landscapes also, uh, winter is a time it's like synonymous with death in some ways in poetry and uh, so this was just looking at that. Also looking at how built form and the natural forms are, you know, the, the, 
the examples for those in all over this country and how a lot of our architecture for the sacred is built engaging with the landscape. So this is when I started working with the landscape parts, then all of this started coming into the work. This is another series which is uh, inspired by these uh, Mani stones in uh, uh, the high Himalayan landscape. And uh, when I first saw these objects, um, I just said, felt the power of them, although I couldn't read what was said. It, it could say anything, but somehow they were invested with whoever had carved on them, whatever they had carved, they, they had invested a certain something into that material and that connected with me again. And uh, that's sort of what I try and do in this series as well, where just through a process of writing, through a process of uh, just engaging with this, with the material, you're investing something of that, which for me is like a meditative process uh, in the studio. And then you think that the, the material sort of packs that information that you've invested in it and communicates that to someone else. This is also the way, uh, looking at all this, uh, street shrines, um, I look at street shrines a lot all over the country and uh, how they, sort of this thing gets abstracted into sculpture when you're in the studio. So essentially I'm just drawing from all this architecture that references the sacred and iconography and old texts and sometimes I sort of think of, uh, like to think of myself as this uh, contemporary <coughs> musician where you're just sampling the old and making something new out of it. Uh, again, just connecting back to that landscape and uh, what was so amazing about being in that space or what always is when you go there is, is how infinite that seems, how you just, even if you look at a photo like that, you have no idea how many miles that last peak is and I live at my studios in Gurgaon where you know if I see 100 meters on a good day that's like fantastic. So it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing how that, that sense of whiteness or a landscape which is kind of uh, falls off the map really. And uh, at some point I started uh, experimenting with how you could literally, you know, just put that landscape into the work. And uh, so I started experimenting with uh, transferring photos that I'd taken onto the clay through a digital printing process. But also bringing in the chortans and the rocks and the iconography and really to sort of work in a way where the technology didn't overshadow what you were trying to do with that whole idea. And uh, so these were, these were just uh, Himalayan tableaus that I made uh, each. And, and it's again drawing the same elements but uh, trying to keep, keep that uh, balance in favor of what you're investing again into the, the, the the clay rather than just uh, letting the technology overpower what was happening here. So all over this uh, country and, and all over Southeast Asia especially, there's a lot to look at if you're interested in all this and street shrines. And for me, you know, as a contemporary person, when you see now somebody has just locked a bell in place because they don't want you to steal the bell. But uh, for you, it just suddenly Get, you know, gains other meaning and uh, I use a lot of locks and keys in my work as well and that started coming into, these are uh, just a set of uh, pillars that I did and so these sort of metal elements started coming in into the work, um, just this kind of ritualistic element. Again, working with the surface where you embed and you stamp and you texture and you layer and just try to build up something which is where you, you have this sense of time where uh, you don't have, you can't really tell when it was made. So, 
again going back to how this uh, the meditativeness and the process of repetition which I do a lot of uh, in, in my work and uh, it, to me it absolutely is the opposite of boring to repeat something so it's just uh, when you repeat it just gives you a space to engage with the space especially rather than just and, and to get into just uh, it's, it's great to explore an idea that you have just repeatedly this is where uh, there was a circular thing going back uh, referencing the prayer wheels in the Himalayan landscape and uh, uh, working with these and they were called topographies of a formless world and it's like in a sense it looks like mapping of uh, some kind of mapping in a sea of nothingness the monasteries when you look at that landscape and the landscape is so stark and so so dry in a way but when you get to the monasteries they're just saturated with color and they're just exploding with with that richness and that sort of color palette also comes into my work quite directly but again uh, the content is 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 not quite uh, traditional the content is not so here this is from a show that I had in Bombay nine years ago called Revolution with the R in brackets. And it was this whole playing around with the idea of what is spiritual change, you know, how does this come about? Is it something which is evolutionary? Can you grow from monkey into a Buddha? Or uh, is it just one sort of revolutionary moment where the gestalt of your looking changes? So these, uh, of course, uh, we can recognize them as uh, symbols which we use in uh, meditation or in, uh, in uh, kirtan. And uh, just blowing them up large in ceramic uh, is also like, uh, in a sense, uh, taking the, the, transporting them from the realm of sound to the realm of soundless because it's, it's, it's not something that you can use as an instrument anymore. Uh, and also for me, it becomes important to just add the subtext just for myself. So uh, there's this, uh, the fact that it's the leather tong which is connecting the two. And leather is not, in, in some traditional places, leather is not something you can take into a temple. But I can't see why not. So it's uh, just getting that in instead of using uh, thread. Looking at these lines, uh, uh, till quite recently I didn't know that these, uh, when they use the two colored lines, it's actually a reference to the male and female energy. It's the yin and the yang, really. And the, or the Shiv and the Parvati or the, you know, so, so just, uh, uh, it's sometimes you get aware of, you, you're using something similar in your work, but uh, it's not unless and until you have to uh, write an essay or talk to people that you become aware of a lot of what you're doing in the studio. Uh, again, this uh, taking off on the expression of uh, religion that we have in the country where there's an element of uh, supreme kitsch which is there all, all over the roadside. So this is taking off on that. But playing into that uh, sort of a twist by making them in porcelain so which is which is in the clay world it's got this uh, sort of high value so you're taking this uh, really kitschy expression you're using uh, molds which are picked up from the street uh, quite cheaply which are made in latex maybe and you know they sell for 150 200 rupees then you make a mold out of that and uh, re recast them in in porcelain and this whole thing about taking something which is uh, very uh, grassroots, popular, but elevating it and putting it into the gallery. Very happy to show these works in Bombay. Uh, I was showing them uh, nine years ago. It's a series called Walk the Talk. And uh, the whole idea here was uh, that uh, it's uh, one thing, just it's, it's touching again back to the, this uh, the spiritual and the religious uh, thing that I was talking about. So here the idea was to say that it's it's okay to uh, refer to the outside and to the form, but uh, it's also something about uh, 
finding something of that, you know, the form is referring to something formless within you which you have to somehow access and walk, walk where that takes you. So not just to pay lip service to the, spirit, the spiritual and the religious, but to actually um, have your life, uh, in a sense, uh, going, um, growing from that feeling. And uh, when they were shown in Bombay, there was this, uh, there was a court case filed against the artist uh, and uh, a non-bailable arrest warrant, which I never thought I, I could <laughs> have an experience like that, but it's all good. And uh, nine years later, it was decided in favor of the artist. So I'm very happy to say that, and here I am back in Bombay. <laughs> And uh, like I said, uh, my studio is uh, in Gurgaon, which is like, uh, you know, exemplifies urban India in, in some ways. And this is what you could see on a given day driving to your studio. I live in Delhi, I drive to Gurgaon every day. And even if we're desensitized to all this, I think something's just so striking that it's just amazing how you could see this magnificent creature and still in the middle of the road and all this Russia traffic and everything. The metro is being constructed, the towers are coming up for your cell phones and everything. And, and uh, this is looking at from the Jama Masjid to this uh, cell phone, the phone towers framed by the, one of the arches in the Jama Masjid. And also these kids uh, dressed up uh, I don't know exactly is what, uh, Hanuman. but Hanuman, yes, Hanuman and who else? Anyway, uh, sacred art in India is a living art. It's, it's something which is alive, it's something that you see that all over the city really. The old and the new, everything is just, um, it's all there in that melting pot. That's the view from my studio where I work. And so that led me to make these, uh, at some point, uh, I've been working on a series of what I call urban temples. And that was uh, one of the first ones in glass and ceramic. And this was one of the, the ones that I made after that, where there's a video playing in the sanctum, sanctorium, and it's uh, my car being worshipped at uh, various temples in Delhi. And when, you know, when, when I bought this car, uh, this is this Japanese Honda car and you take it to whether it's a South Indian temple or a Sai Baba temple and they all do a different ritual on it so in a sense it's like completely um, bizarre but also there isn't uh, there's automatically communion where where you know that where, which is actually where some true engagement can happen that's my studio and uh, I'm so happy to share a photo of the studio, which has given me so much joy. As you can see in this photo, I'm very happy working there every day. And uh, thank you all. Hello, my name is Neha. And uh, I think uh, uh, one of the important things to say, I did not get into ceramics accidentally. I I knew that's what I wanted to do when I was very little, actually. I did Ikebana in school, and I always thought I want to make pots, but I did not, eventually I didn't make any pots. I made some pots, but I don't identify myself as a potter. Uh, and I make sculpture uh, in ceramics. Um, so uh, I am, going to start with this image. Uh, the, the first few images that I will show over here are from uh, 2008 to 2010. Um, and I was uh, looking at a lot of architecture, look, looking at a lot of urban architecture. Um, and, and the way uh, it reacted to that. Um, and I'm looking at these uh, spaces, uh, urban spaces, which are very chaotic. And the only place of really sort of that of, of finding calm in in the chaos, I thought, was on the sparse, sort of ugly, stark surfaces of uh, brutalist modern buildings. Um, and I thought it was very interesting how calmly they were, in some sense, with the light recording the happenings of the very chaotic street. And uh, somewhere, somewhere, I, I ceramics is a 
as a lot of you know, is, is, a, is a horrible medium. It drives you crazy uh, and, and you hate it as much as you love it. Uh, but you hate it uh, because it's driving you mad all the time. Uh, and, and somewhere, but it suits you, it suits you, right? You can't work in any other medium somehow as well. So, so still, you're still working with it and you're fighting with it and somewhere, the, somehow, the way to find... I, I was looking at my work as a way to, and to find that balance. Look for some sort of quiet in the shantam uh, through my work. And, um, and I found it in the way that I was working with clay, that in the temperament with which I was working with clay, in, 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 in my body language, in a very subtle way of working, in a very minimalistic way of working, and in, in the aesthetic as well. And, um, and then in the way that I, I chose to show my work. Um, so, looking back at what I was doing then, I realized that already a sort of uh, preoccupation with the way I work and what my body is doing when it's working with clay has had, had, had begun. Uh, so this is actually, um, this is 2014 and it's one of the first works that I, I went to the Royal College of Art uh, to do an MA. Uh, which was another horrible, I mean, wonderful, horrible experience. Well, you know, the first year they are killing you and telling you that everything that you've been doing for all of these years is, is you don't do it. And I was in a place of complete confusion and, and figuring out for myself. I was doing amazing things, and but I was trying to figure out for myself what it is that I wanted to be making. And uh, at that point, this work was made where I was doing, or uh, I was drawing with porcelain, with uh, sort of liquid uh, slip. Uh, with some paper in it uh, to give it strength, um, and I was I was drawing uh, I was doing these porcelain drawings, and then uh, for a show in India for um, for Ray's seventieth birthday that happened in Delhi, I, I had to, I sent I sent this work uh, which was uh, which was basically a collage of the porcelain drawings that I was making. Um, uh, some drawings, uh, some ink drawing, and and old photographs of my work, and it re it, it really it's sort of a, a playful reference to all of uh, to my prejudices if, uh, about the medium and everything that I thought I was doing and what I thought I knew about uh, you know about my understanding of architecture, my understanding of light, something that I thought I had studied, and everything that was falling apart. Um, and then. Uh, meanwhile, I had been drawing, and and this was something that was really, really important to me. It's also very different in so many ways from the work that I, I did as a ceramic uh, in ceramics. Uh, you know, before this, it was it was really and the way of working, it was really not sort of intimate at all. It was it was very gestural. I was using my entire body to move and looking at the human body as well and I'm beginning to while looking at the body, it's actually looking at a at a body for the first time properly, you know, like a uh, like to study it. Um, and uh, looking at the body as architecture, as something that's uh, that has a certain purpose. Uh, and then I have been a Kathak dancer uh, for most of my life. And, and there has always been a certain awareness of my own body, of what it's doing and how it's moving and all of those things. But then I was also studying anatomy and, um, and, 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 and very seriously studying anatomy. I mean, I did dissection drawing uh, uh, courses and uh, sort of uh, re uh, reconstruct facial reconstruction courses to actually understand what the muscles are actually doing in the body and how it is that it makes things move and it was really through the drawing uh, for me that this relationship between my body uh, the material like my body the material that I was working with then this gesture of making and then the object that I'm making so was somehow consolidated um, and uh, I, I, this, which is why I've included these slides because it was a really, really important sort of uh, place for me in my head. Um, and I will talk to you now about four of the projects that I have done since that are sort of important sort of marking uh, points in the work that I make in my practice and in the way I practice. 
and one um, work that is in progress. Uh, so the first work, I will, I will talk about this, is, is was called Plate in the Form of a Painting. Um, and this, actually, this work actually started with these two conflicted, conflicting images, again in London, and you're constantly bombarded with these sort of um, appeals to uh, send money to, uh, to Africa because of that. And then you are in these supermarkets, which have always fascinated me. They're awesome, they're huge, and there is this feeling of there is enough for everybody, and there's so much, and we'd never go hungry again, and it's all going to be amazing. And it's not, of course, it's an illusion. And, um, and there was this sort of, uh, this need to understand the idea of consumption, and what it is actually to, to consume and put in your, in your body, and and this sort of, it, it it came out of this sort of, out of these sort of this, this conflict of these two images in my head that I mean I was constantly bombarded with when I was um, in in London, and we see it here as well. But I mean it's really sort of was highlighted uh, over there, um, and uh, this was one of the first things that came out of it. It was, and then again you sort of approaching it with a like when I. I start playing automatically, and and it started as this sort of stop motion animation film that I small film thing that I made, um, and then I was looking at people eating and drawing them, um, and it was interesting because again there are, there are these sort of gestures that I'm making on the paper, and I'm actually looking, observing people eating. Um, and and there's there's something like as 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 wonderful as it is, and there was this there's this uh, you know I mean think of food as an offering to yourself and all of that, but then there's also the way in which we eat, uh, just which can also be really quite gross sometimes. Um, and so I started look, and then I was also looking at uh, videos of people speed eating, which was really awesome and horrible. And I mean, you know, that, that, that gesture of stuffing food into your mouth, like just stuffing, 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 like meaninglessly, uh, like eat a uh, hundred <coughs> eggs in, in uh, a minute. It is, it's, it's, it's ridiculous and it's amazing. And, it, and again, there are all these conflicts which have to be really fit. You can't, I mean, none of the speed eaters, I studied speed eaters, none of the speed eaters are like obese people. They're really, really fit fit like I mean and, and they take their job very seriously. There's an amazing video of uh, of like the world champion uh, Yamaguchi maybe he's Japanese uh, uh, competing with a bear and taking the competition very seriously. I mean first you think that obviously this is going to be funny. But no 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 he is they're they're both competing uh, hot dogs. It's a hot dog competition and then he's eating and he's looking at the bear and he's stuffing his face. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, but it's very, very, very serious. It's, just, it's taken as a sport. They even try to take it to the Olympics and all of that. So, I'm, I'm, so I've been looking at, at this sort of gesture, this sort of violent, uh, like amazing violent gesture of, like, which is aggressive. I mean, but it is, it is a gesture to nourish. Um, um, and, and I started sort of thinking about it as sort of, uh, thinking about it, of it in terms of my body, and in terms of you know whatever latent, uh, like I mean, if you look at uh, every uh, ev everybody has like all of these sort of worlds in them, and all of these sort of uh, you know like your nine dresses in you. So I mean, it has to be there somewhere. So I mean, it, I don't have to work from the shantam, subtle minimalistic yet wanting to kill the clay place. You know, I can actually start to sort of and like like really go for it and it this became basically a um, an exercise for me in letting in sort of in, in actually engaging with the clay in, in a in a very very physical entire body hit slam you know jump elbow full like a, a full body uh, sort of exercise uh, this is fake, of course, because I, I, I did one gesture and tried to take a photograph and then did another gesture and tried to take a photograph. So it obviously doesn't work that way. But then what came of it was this series of plates. So they are plates. They are, they are, they are really large. Okay, not that large. They are large plates that 
um, that are meant for sharing. And then they are obviously you know not functional really because you can't really put anything uh, of much consequence on there. But um, but then I mean the whole process. If they've been fired around uh, uh, seven or eight times each. Um, and they are loaded with a lot of color. Like every time, I would add more color to it, and uh, like just, just. I mean, so it was about. And even for me, it was, it, it was like so not my way of working, and it was taking me to my limit, and it was taking the material to its limit as well because of the amount of times I was firing and how ruthless I was with it. They've been sort of glazed forward and back, um, and then I sort of load it with this color and this tin glaze that flows and uh, and, and with gold and. And they are sort of grotesque, and they are also quite beautiful, actually. So, um, so it was about this sort of, you know, thinking and exploring my own gesture. Um, okay, and uh, and and that sort of uh, brought me to this work that I was that uh, that I started doing uh, soon after those, uh, which was about. Um, Again, exploring the relationship between my body and making, and two, exploring the relationship between what I uh, what I am making and my body. And uh, it's very interesting that when, uh, you know I never make anything. Uh, I, I don't make anything utilitarian, um, um, but I love holding ceramic objects. I, I I have mugs and things like that that I love, and 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 I am constantly touching up ceramic objects and other objects as well and I mean for me it's also I think my, my work can be like most of the work that I make is it, it is about holding it. I mean I, I encourage people to also touch it and hold it and and if it breaks it breaks but to engage with it in um, in their own way and it started from this project really it was about sort of taking one, does the work, I mean, can I make the work an extension of myself? I mean, it's an extension of my gesture. Can it actually become an actual extension of my body? Um, and then taking it outside the studio, taking it off the pedestal, but into sort of, and, and sort of, these were sort of, I took them out on the road, uh, on the road. Uh, this, was, this was the first, one of the first pieces, which was a sort of a test. Um, into the Victoria and Albert Museum. Now that is the, I mean, so then does that mean that I'm shown at the Victoria and Albert Museum? And then I was also, uh, I was also sort of having these really uh, strange, interesting, terrible conversations with people on the road and, and, and all of that. Body plus it shrinks, so it's sort of also quite, um, it's, it's holding you, it's quite tight. This is like a corset and it's not the most comfortable, it's not comfortable. It's not meant to be comfortable either, but I mean, when I mean, with this image on the uh, left, with this image on the left, um, when I look at it, like I've I've taken these objects out on the street, but then you know, I mean, we've been talking about sort of uh, reclaiming public spaces and things like that, and and somewhere you think that okay, you know, I mean, like you know, is it my is it like. Uh, is it my place to be out on the street? And then is it like is it like stupid that I'm actually trying to bring my sculpture out on the street? And that actually was then a starting point for this body of work, which was called Autoethnography through Objects, um, through which I sort of which became sort of like uh, they are autobiographical autobiographical objects. I mean, of course they've been fiction. I mean, they're I mean autobiography is both fiction and fact. Um, and it, it, it was my way of sort of relating to the sort of wider, uh, you know, social, cultural, political sort of uh, place and, and, my, and my own story. And so, uh, so this was, um, I know, this was called Ceramic Woman. And then, the, so, the, so the work is the photograph, uh, it is the object, and then it is actually uh, um, encouraging people to uh, engage with the object and play with the object and do with the object what they what they want to do with an object. Um, and for me, it uh, again the making is very uh, personal and bodily. A lot of the a lot of them are made on my body, and they come from my experience and my memories and from. Um, the like you think about the intangible uh, knowledge from my body and and uh, from from these encounters uh, and then the actual uh, 
the actual object is quite fictional, but it, it, it really comes from my story. Um, and then and then there are these uh, photographs that I've taken, which are some of them are quite theatrical. I mean, they aren't they aren't a performance performance performed for people since. Uh, but they are performed as photographs um, and, and sort of composed as photographs. And then, so so uh, so this is another image um, from this work. Um, and then uh, people are encouraged. So then that, that is I mean the whole thing that until the point of sort of interact interaction. Uh, with other people, uh, so I'm looking at. So when I make the object, the object is quite benign in a way, and, and the way I have thought of it is quite. Um, I mean, it, it's. It, I mean, when you look at me standing over there with it, I mean, there's something quite menacing about it. Um, and then, immediately when somebody else handles the same object, uh, it sort of completely sort of uh, changes and becomes sometimes quite. Um, Yes, this is another body of work, and uh, so I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, this started with you see all of these sort of bits and pieces of clay that are left on your work table when you're, and sometimes when you're talking to people, you sort of filling with clay and leaving bits and pieces around, and and began to think about that as a sort of documentation of of that conversation and that documentation is not audio visual in, in, in the usual sense but it's still it's still a recording of a conversation that happened um, and then I began to record in that way my own uh, body language um, and this was a group of work called thought casts and it's seven casts from my body sort of directly sort of cast from my body um, from from move, from things that I do like from my uh, body language uh, and, and shown like that and then this is going on to Israel last year uh, Sharvani and I were on this residency in Israel um, and these are some of the things that um, that I saw uh, and this was a very 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 important project actually uh, for me uh, so that is uh, up there uh, it's in a refugee camp in Bethlehem. Uh, that uh, the center picture is the wall in Bethlehem. Um, so, so that's the West Bank. Uh, that the, the soldiers on so these are uh, Palestinian soldiers. That is a, the on the right is uh, so Israeli soldiers in Hebron, which is in the West Bank, but it's a sort of uh, it's not a settlement. It's a it's a it, so there are three types of cit cities in the West Bank, uh, those that are controlled by the, uh, controlled politically and uh, mili uh, uh, the military and the, what is it called, the normal municipal control and political control is with, uh, uh, with the Palestinians, then those which the military control is with the uh, Israelis, but the municipal um, control is with the Palestinians and then those where the military and the municipal uh, control is with the uh, Israelis. Uh, so Bethlehem is a, is a city where the control like is, is completely, I think the ABC, no? A is with the uh, Palestinians entirely and Hebron was basically, the control was completely with the Israelis. Um, and then, so, so, the, so I mean, there are checkpoints on the streets. So there are streets where uh, Palestinians can walk. There are streets where Palestinians cannot walk. I mean, it's, it's a it's a very strange space. And Sharvani and I were there actually together. This was a, an olive tree. <laughs> we got lost because we were photographing we this. The end of the tour because we were surprised by uh, that we were tree. Yes, and then again, there is this the idea of religion. Barbed wire fences everywhere, but then they are there in India, in Bombay, everywhere as well. And this was a, a group of objects that I made. Um, that, so these are my responses to being there. This was a group of objects that I made that were that are gleaned from short stories by Mando about the partition and by uh, doc and from documentary writing by Ben 
Erhen right? I, I may not be pronouncing that right, from his travels in the West Bank. And, and that's a documentary writing about Israel and Palestine. And uh, when I, I mean, the, the, the objects themselves, for me, they were sort of crucial parts of the stories that uh, the stories revolved around. Um, and and of course, I've, I mean, I've, I've magnified them, I've distorted them, I have uh, abstracted them. Uh, and and for me, they're sort of witness to what happened in the stories and what happened to what happens in sort of very in you to humans in conflicted uh, and hostile environments. Um, and then this is an image. For, uh, this is, this is a drawing that I made, but it was the, the, I was thinking about the idea of sort of rooting myself in a foreign land, and I performed these photographs in uh, in three places. Uh, so that is uh, Hebron, which is the the city that we're talking about. There was a settlement uh, outside of Hebron, near Hebron, called Kiria Darba, and I made one of my performances, I mean photographic performances, over there. And then the other two, well, I mean, one was in, in Jerusalem where I was working, and, uh, and then this is difficult to understand. That then there's uh, like the, in, in a place called Hisma, which is basically it is outside of the Jerusalem municipality, but um, inside the actual wall. So the red line over there is where the wall is, and the green line is the actual municipal boundary of Israel. Um, and so I was, I was working in these sort of conflicting areas, and, and of course, all of these, all of the places that I worked in was without permission. Um, they're sort of, sort of uh, guerrilla performances. They sort of go there quickly, set it up, take a photograph. I mean, two of the photographs have uh, were taken with help from Noah, and one I constructed myself and was with, done with a timer, um, sort of self-timed thing. Uh, but I mean, the whole idea was to sort of. Uh, one talk about rooting myself. We talk about you know the idea of rootedness and uprootedness, and you know we saw these amazing, beautiful olive trees, and and one of the ways to sort of uh, psychologically uh, mess with the Palestinians is to uproot their olive trees that they consider like children. Um, but then also think about the idea of uh, of sort of being rooted to a home, um, and then. And then the idea of the first uh, sort of colonization, you know, reclaiming light, right to the earth by actually planting trees and art and agriculture. So, uh, so um, yeah, so that was the way I sort of, I mean, that's how these sort of three images in the end came about. Um, and, the, and my third sort of uh, response to being there was, uh, was through rocks, really. Um, and 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 you know and this was also when I was researching when I was res when I was doing my research for um, for uh, Israel uh, was when uh, sort of you know the Kashmir had again sort of become a thing uh, thing I mean, it's always been a thing and it's uh, sort of it had erupted uh, <laughs> it had erupted <laughs> sorry about that uh, and and there was there are these images of people. Um, you know, uh, protesting with the with stones and by, I I think it's very, I thought it's a very powerful and, and then one of them is from Kashmir and one of them is from from in Palestine. Uh, I can't remember which is which right now, but it doesn't matter. For me, what was important was the idea of sort of of um, of protesting with the land in some way when you pick up a stone and and you're hitting it. You're sort of you're protesting with your body, but you're protesting uh, with the land. And uh, I thought, I think it's very, very, um, this was something that was very powerful. There's also my preoccupation with picking up stones wherever I go, which is also a, a need to pick up a piece of that, of, of the land. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I found a lot of stones in your room later. I was, I was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I was admonished for that. <laughs> So, which is a need to sort of take from the land and take a part of the land with you, and uh, and so uh, um, and then there was this this again in um, in Hebron where the uh, the 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 Israelis used to throw uh, stones into Palestinian houses, and so they had these sort of uh, grills made outside their houses to to stop that from happening. Um, and so uh, there was a performance that I did alongside stones that I had picked up. 
through my travel in Israel, in Israel, at Jerusalem, Ramallah, Bethlehem, and um, and stones that I had made myself. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so I mean, this. Uh, so I've been sort of thinking about uh, again, you know, like the, my work as an extension of myself as as prosthetics. And you, when when you're working in clay, the tools. Uh, tools become an extension of yourself, you know. So, in, so, so the idea of looking, at, I mean, I've, I've been looking at tools as an extension of myself. This is in progress, I'm still resolving this thing, but I just thought. Um, and so I made these sort of prosthetic extensions uh, for, um, it's a, a group of prosthetic fingers that serve various uh, real and fictitious functions and uh, they are, they can be used to sort of caress, nurture, groom, and love, and it's sort of accompanied by a, a instruction booklet. Uh, you know, I mean, how 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 does one how does one love through a medium? How does you know? And you're constantly doing that. We're constantly doing that, but uh, sort of just sort of bringing that out. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I think we want to. Well, this is Savia Neha, Anjani, Sharbani, Vineet, Shampa, and I'm Madhvi. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Vineet, I found your art most interesting. Mm -hmm. I wanted to understand that when you give life to a piece, what is that goes in your mind? Like, you know, the word you mentioned, the, it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, uh, the mind comes in only later when you're talking about the work. When you're actually in the studio, it's uh, quite an intuitive process, really. So it's more engagement with the material. You have uh, something at the back of your mind, maybe some, some sort of... Uh, uh, you have an idea of what you want to do, and then a lot just develops in that engagement with the material. So I, I would say that uh, uh, when I was talking about the work, uh, it seems like there's actual thought going into, you know, but, but at that point, the thought is more uh, intuitive rather than uh, articulated. Yeah. And how would you define in your own words value and price? <laughs> I have no clue how to answer that one. <laughs> no, but when you said, like, spiritually, when you invest into something, Things become sacred. But value, I don't know what kind of, if you're talking about value you put for an artwork in the gallery, I think um, that just evolves with a discussion with the gallerist maybe, or um, it's, it's not something that, uh, I don't know, the, the, I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, no, I think he's asking you to differentiate between value and price. In your own words, like how you give the whole commentary about the soul and everything. How do you interpret it? You know, uh, I'm not sure I'm answering what you've asked, but uh, uh, for the artist, the really important bit, at least for, for me, is, is just that engagement with the material in the studio, which yeah. gives me a lot of joy, okay? And uh, where it goes, when it goes into the gallery, what price it sells at, where the value becomes an actual tangible price is something that is part of a process, but it's not really the, the more interesting part for me. Have you bought yourself any artwork of any other artist? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, every favorite? now and then, I'm not so good remembering, but I have some Jyoti Bhats. There's a Manisha Parekh. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of uh, ceramic artists, friends whose work, sometimes you uh, exchange works with friends, you know, contemporaries. So, Every now and then you, you like something. What uh, is the feeling you get when you sell one art piece? Relief. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Anand. And thank you everybody for bringing me closer back to Earth and geology. At one time I was in petroleum engineering and so all in the team back and forth with it. Uh, New Mexico spent a lot of time there. Uh, Himalaya not since the early school days, but it's great, beautiful. So I'm curious, do you, everybody on the panel, uh, and I saw the Poimbetka uh, uh, pieces, 
So I'm curious, do you go over, cross the borders into academic disciplines, into anthropology or geology, and, and try to connect there as part of maybe, I don't know, three week course, or do you teach in the summers or the winters when there's no formal courses and go and do that? None of us teach. Um, I don't teach, uh, but, but I definitely uh, don't really separate the arts and the sciences, so I draw inspiration from geology, medical texts, the landscape, the land that Vineet was showing that echoes a lot with me in terms of the landscape that I work in. So yeah, and, and I, I'm hungry for knowledge. So whenever one has an ability to gain some, I do, I do try, that's for me. That's for me. All right. I think uh, uh, every now and then I, I do enjoy teaching every now and then, although I've never taught formally. But it's, it's mostly uh, helping people also to connect with a, a space which is very, very uh, accessible to each one of us and which you can, uh, in a sense, reach without getting uh, kind of mired in actual technique and all of that. Just, just an intuitive space where you can uh, work very, very quickly, where you, which you can access and very quickly, it starts giving you very interesting results. So sometimes I work with people that way. You have to say that, but when you go back to office and studio and Gurga, or not the kind of father. So I wonder. Mr. Kwan. I, uh, since I was working with this Museum of Anthropology for 21 years, and um, you know, I have, I love listening to stories, and I love telling stories. So. I, I do this on a very regular basis with, you know, there's a, muse there's a school which is called Museum School in Bhopal where, um, where you know, children who pick rags and all are, you know, the school is run in the museums. So the classes happen in the museums. The children are just, they don't have a building, but the, but the children um, have their classes in the museum. So the, Long back, long, long back, they used to come to an exhibition in the uh, Museum of Mankind where I used to work and, and I had curated this exhibition which is called Mythology Trail. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, you know, that is how it started and I would uh, narrate to the children those stories and I still do it with other schools also now and uh, so. And it, the interesting part uh, when you are you know, narrating the story to children is, you know, many a times they get so engaged and you see them as potential character, entering the story as a character, and then, uh, you know, then there's these twists in the story and um, it becomes very interesting sometimes. But is the question that have you talked with, I mean, about teaching or is that... Yeah. Do we have any idea the academic freedom to explore, to bring you, not from traditionally PhDs or academic? Right, well, I actually have my master's in ceramics from the US, so I have taught, I haven't taught in the last 10 years, but I've taught at university level, at uh, craft, uh, uh, community level, school level, formally, and uh, so, but I haven't taught in the last 10 years, no time, the studio takes up most of the time, which is, uh, which, I mean, I love teaching, so I do miss that. Thank you. Hi. Anyone else wants to answer? I can do my question. Yes, do you want the others to talk about this, or? Go ahead. Do you want to say something? No. Okay. Hi. Okay, uh, so this is uh, just, I mean, when I was observing uh, you know, your presentations, a few of you, and I've been visiting a lot. I, I'm not an artist, but I admire art, and I, keep uh, seeing it. And very often I think every form of art is a self-expression of the artist. Yeah. Uh, but very often when you express something, it's so much in your mind and what comes across is not easy for someone else to read. What is it that was actually your thought process? Yeah, but when we get the opportunity to actually see you present, it had, had so much more meaning in what you do. And I think the appreciation from a person who's watching it uh, multiplies tenfold when, when you heard the artist's version of his or her work. 
Yeah. Uh, so I really wonder where uh, very often sometimes works uh, are just kept maybe at best a title. And a title is very useful sometimes to understand what's at the back of the mind of an artist. But even more important, text of you know the artist saying, what do I wish to express through this piece? And, and I just wonder that, you know, is there sometimes a thought that you wish with every piece to attach some text, to attach some explanation of what this piece means to you? Which I think just enhances the whole experience of that work to the audience, whoever's watching it or seeing it or using it. Hi. So, um, uh, you know, when you spoke about the title, for me, it's it's almost like you you know you create something. It's also like us as a creation. So it's like naming a baby. So you give a starting point to some object, or uh, you know, a sculptural form. But uh, I'm, I personally would be quite averse to you know kind of. Uh, bringing it down to a text because it's also kind of feeding, pre-feeding the viewer and not leaving that open-endedness to kind of, you know, explore further because it's, um, you can fill an object or a, you know, sculptural piece with thousand words but finally it's, it's, it's a visual material and it has to have that open-endedness to take you to some unknown, uh, you know, place and also an object is incomplete without a viewer and his viewer. So, you know, I feel a sculptural work or a visual work is, you know, incomplete without its viewer. So text is something too, too um, kind of uh, forced, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I don't want to let you know anything. <laughs> it's in my head and I don't want to share it. I've made something, but I don't necessarily want to tell you the story. <laughs> so, it's also interesting to hear for the artists the, the, the other side of the equation of yeah. seeing how you're responding because you know we have our own our own lenses, our own vision that we're putting into it, but just seeing how other people respond and the interpretations they're getting out of it opens your own experience of your own piece, and you see it in a, in a diff, with different eyes sometimes. So that is a very valuable experience feeling. So uh, I actually, uh, uh, I, uh, in the way I, that I work, uh, I think text is important. I very rarely show my work, so I don't know about putting the text next to the work. But uh, but when 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 I am making in so somewhere mid process, I I I write something for myself, which helps me uh, go forward, and which tells me which I mean which becomes this point at which I sort of because because I use so many different points of reference that I know are all connected, it, that becomes, the text becomes for me the place where I bring them together. And it helps me resolve what I'm actually doing. So it's come to be an important part of my process, but I don't know and about actually sharing. <laughs> but, but I think, at least for me, I, I struggle with this thing of how much to tell. So, that, so like you said, like the clue, something that directs you, Reveals just enough and not too much because you don't want to make it boring either. Yeah, experience for the views. Yeah, at the same time, I think um, had you spoken about uh, his work or her work, you know, that might have been as interesting or perhaps more. So. <laughs> <laughs> I really love the, your journey. You shared like how you explored the material, the yes. learning, unlearning. Yes. That really inspires common people how to go about it. Completely, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, actually, also to answer that question uh, uh, which you asked about teaching and learning. So also in clay, like for me, um, I would say uh, I spoke quite a bit about unlearning with my practice in painting, but um, my learning happened in the studios that I shared and you know with uh, I engaged with everyday people you know at that that studio that I spoke about was kind of a hub of um, you know uh, 
people who came for uh, hobby classes, housewives, potters, artists. So it was kind of an active space and um, uh, with clay there is something about the knowledge of the hands, you know, which is something, which, which is something that uh, each one kind of acquires, you know, and you cannot kind of, each one has something to give you. So that is, um, uh, you know, something really important in terms of, so at some point when I feel I acquire, you know, enough of knowledge so of the hands. How did the whole journey take time from scratch to the art piece? Um, it depends. Sometimes, you know, a work, like I said, that the books I was collecting, I was holding it for, I don't know, about six, seven years, and, you know, one fine day, that whole, you know... Um, no, as a uh, clay, as a material, when you started exploring from the scratch? From the scratch, I, I, I can't give you an exact timeline, but about, uh, like, uh, the work that I showed you, the, uh, the uh, shape-shifting field, that took about eight to nine months to build, hand build. So, it varies from a, a month to about no, I was eight or nine months. My journey when you started shifting from painting to clay. Uh, <coughs> it took me about uh, about six years. Because you're changing yeah. as a domain yeah. from this yes. to that. Yeah. So about six years, and I would say initial three years was all experimental work. Exploration, experimentation. Yes, yes, completely. And as artists, do you think that you'll be passing on your legacy to anybody? In the hand. <laughs> Hi. I find all of you are very natural people, natural artists. But uh, I would like to ask you one question. Since you said you have you are working in Israel, journalism and all, because I find you a very brazen person actually. That to work over there, you know, there are a lot of conflicts going on, a lot of fighting going on, but how you landed over there and you started working? You were not scared, nothing will happen to you? Or you were only completely engrossed with your art only, so you never bothered about what is happening? I was, I was not scared, but I mean, <coughs> that experience happened because it, it was, actually the people that organized the experience were I think a lot more brave than uh, yeah. I could be. Uh, so it was a group of uh, Israeli uh, artists that organized that. It's a, it's a gallery in Tel Aviv called Benyam, the Benyamini Cera Contemporary Ceramic Center. And uh, it was, the exhibition was called Post-Colonialism? Uh, and, and there were nine artists working in ceramics uh, and glass from all over the world, and nine Israeli and Palestinian artists. Um, and it was, I think what was was really brave was for the Israeli artists to actually organize an exhibition like that, that is actually questioning, uh, is asking whether we, we are sort of post-colonial uh, uh, today in Israel, and I think, I was also there in the same residency, and nice. and she's right. I mean, it's um, um, the impression one has of Israel from outside, and I have many discussions about this in the U.S. because the the idea is that it is an extremely right-wing, very uh, rigid uh, system, and but there is a very strong voice for people who are asking for just human rights and human values and and so these people who who put up the proposal for I mean which I which we both applied for and got into they've been working on it for two years and in the, in danger of being shut down all the time so she's very right about this the, the bravery really is because they have to then stay with that we all came and we left but for the people who organized it and the Israeli artists who participated with us and the Palestinian artists, it was uh, it was an extraordinary journey. I mean, yes, there is some sense of, I've never been to Israel before, and I didn't know what to expect, but I think it is probably one of the most powerful experiences I have ever been through. You know, I mean, and she was talking about the language, of, she was talking about stones, I too had a piece called The Language of Stones, and just to give you an idea, you know, she was showing the pieces where they were throwing the stones in protest. But the other site that we went to in Kiryat Arba, which she showed, 
there was also a, a, the, the Jewish tradition where they put rocks on the on a, on a gravestone to show a mark of respect. So my piece was also about the language of stones, one of them, you know, the, in one case, rock of respect, and the other to stone, to throw, to injure. And uh, so I, I think the, the, the time frame, and we were very secure, actually. We were very, very looked after. We were not in any danger at any point. So. One Hope you must be sleeping well in the night, no? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sleep, I just walked through. There was a lot of things I heard about you. That is why I was also wondering that how you people have landed over there. It is, no, it is a very dangerous place. It is not that easy to stay I was really attracted by the proposal and the idea of going there to this, to me, the center of where so much is going on. I wanted to see what was happening and go there. Great.